welcome to a series called The End of Times, where we're going through the book of Revelation verse by verse to see what it is we can expect to happen and what it is we should be doing in the end times. And as we've gone through this book, we've reached that place, the seventh trumpet, at Christ's return. Um, and we've spent the last several episodes talking about what he looks like. Because John gives a great description of what he looks like when those uh, clouds of glory break open and he comes forth like lightning flashes from the east to the west. His appearance is not just this is what he looks like. Every single thing that the Bible describes in his appearance has meaning and we've spent the last several episodes talking about that. But today is going to be a day that's really hopefully eliminating some confusion. I, I'm, I'm prayerful that this doesn't make it more confusing because at his return, there's a lot happening. When that seventh trumpet blast, there is a lot happening. So we're going to kind of focus on that. Uh, it's at that seventh trumpet that the rapture occurs. He comes to judge and make war. There's a lot going on here. So we're going to try to Focus on just the events of what take place at that seventh trumpet and who remains when all is said and done. Now, so we're just going to pick it up where we left off. Revelation 19, starting verse 11. Then I saw heaven open up and behold a white horse and he who sat on was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. I'm going to pause there, because again, we're going to focus on the moment of his return, what is taking place? Because the seventh trumpet blasts and all of a sudden there's a lot of things happening. He comes, we can see him, he's coming to judge and make war. And we just saw a description of this war. It's a declaration by an angel saying, come, there's, about, there's a lot of flesh to be eaten here shortly, birds. So what is taking place? Well, really what's happening is we kind of got to break it down. He's judging and he's making war. And then there's also a rapture occurring. So we're going to kind of jump ahead for just a second. We don't like to jump ahead here, but we're going to, for the sake of this, to 20 verse 4. After the warring part is over um, and everybody's held accountable for, you know, the devil, the dragon, the antichrist, they're all held accountable. Then it says this in 24, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, we did jump ahead. So, you know, there's a lot going on in what we just read. And, and when we get to that section, which we will be in just a few episodes, we'll talk about that in great detail. But what we can gain from that clarity is that who remains? So once that war is over, who remains is the remnant. It is those who were beheaded or were killed during the three and a half years of tribulations. So I want to talk about this for a moment. He wars and kills anybody that followed the Antichrist and had the mark of the beast that remains. And then what's left over is the remnant. And those are the ones who will then reign with him for a thousand years. But how do we do that? How do we get changed? When is that like... So when does all that happen? Like, okay, so he comes back, he's judging, he's making war, but when does this body change? 
And that's kind of what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians first, chapter 15, starting verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that kingdom and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So what he's saying there is that just what we saw in Revelation, that at the end, when that last trumpet blasts, now he's not bringing up the war. He's talking about those who follow Jesus Christ. He's saying now at that last trumpet, the dead will be raised and then we will be changed. Now, when he says the dead, that's not all the dead. That's just those who died during the tribulation at that rapture and then they will never die. So you have this first resurrection of people who, you know, maybe just lost their head a month ago. Um, and now they're resurrected and they're literally standing on this earth in their glorified body. No more corruption, uh, no more sickness, no more death, uh, no more mortality. Like all that is gone. All of that is gone. And then those of us who remain, who are alive, we will also be changed. Well, what does this kind of look like? Well, if we go to 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Meaning, if, you know, if you're alive when Christ returns, and that's my intentions, is to be alive when he returns. But if you're alive, you're going to be in this corruptible body. They're going to raise first. The, the dead who died during tribulation, they're going to raise first. Then they're going to be changed. Then you will be changed. You, you know, or at least at the same time. You won't precede them. You're going to remain in this corruptible body until at least the, ra the dead have been raised from the tribulation. Um, and, and it's very important we see that because a lot of people say, well, you know, th this is another proof. Like the rapture is not taking place seven or eight years earlier. It's taking place at that last trumpet. Uh, be well, why? So we can live for a thousand years. I can't live for a thousand years. By the time Christ returns, I might be 60, 70, 80, 90 years old by the time he returns. I can't go another thousand. This body will have to change. Um, and that's really the only reason for the rapture. But if you even look closer, you know, if you look at that word, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That word caught up is to seize, snatch, or obtain by robbery. It's to grab a hold and seize you. Uh, it, it's a very different thing than what we think it's going to be. But it's to change us. It's a beautiful thing. Like, like, like Paul said, this is not for you to worry. This is to give you hope. This is to show you that that war, that three, even if you die in that three and a half year, year war, or if you stand in court and they say, betray Jesus or lose your head, and you say, never, and they chop your head off, that's you standing there with Jesus Christ in that moment in Revelation. It's important that we begin to see our roles in all of this. And that's the danger and sat satanic suggestion of a pre-tribulation rapture. Clearly, it's at the last trumpet. In that moment, he comes to judge and make war. Now, what I had a hard time wrapping my head around, well, what's, how's all that play out? Like, how long is that trumpet? Is the trumpet a minute long? Is it hours long? Is it days long? Like, how long is that trumpet? Because what I see in Revelation and what I see with the world because he is going to be the king of this world so he will r rule within the realm of time you know because he sits outside of time now but when he rules on this world it will literally a thousand years will rotate around the sun for a thousand times um, just like we do now so with this timeline in order for us to survive in order to, you know so well, what is that? Like that blast of that trumpet, how long does that really go on? Uh, now, what I know of the world is that before you can sit on your throne and judge, you have to conquer the kingdom. 
Um, you know, so the warring when the realm of physics and time should take place first. It's not a very long war. One might say a few seconds to a few minutes. But the rapture doesn't occur before that war. I don't believe because when we look at that war in Zechariah, and we'll go there now, Zechariah 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. This city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So there's that remnant. They remain. They, they are remaining. They won't be cut off. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it towards the south. And then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach Azeel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. So there's this valley, this, this way of escape. So those who are warring in Jerusalem at that moment of his return, retreat. It's time to retreat. He's got it. So if I'm warring in Jerusalem as the remnant and I see all this playing out, then I'm going to flee. I'm going to know that's him. So I'm going to flee between the, the, the mountain valley. Uh, so I have not, from what I understand, I have not been changed at this point. It is some point within the judgment that the change begins. And I want to remind you, in Zechariah 4 and Revelation 11 that the remnant is both the 144,000 Jews and the multitude of tribes, nations, and tongues that stand for Jesus Christ. And we can see that in Zechariah 4 and Revelation 11. We talked about that. But this remnant that remains, it is the one who is caught up. So now if we kind of go back. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great. And we'll jump to 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's the point of all of this. So when that trumpet blasts, when you hear that seventh trumpet blast, it would have been dark up until that point. Then the clouds of glory broken up and as light, lightning flashes from the west, here he comes. And what that'll look like. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his heads were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, that he himself shall rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, same to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And at, that's the warning. And then his feet steps onto the Mount of Olives. That valley breaks open. People flee. The remnant flees. The armies come forth. He melts them like we saw in Zechariah in the Valley of Decision, the great wine press, which is why his robe looks like it was dipped in blood because he... He treads the wine press of the wrath of God. 
and it fills this valley for miles uh, with blood, just fills it with blood. Then thrones are established. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so will we because we have been changed at that last trumpet in the twinkling of an eye. The dead will raise, we then are changed. And then we reign with Christ for a thousand years. So I just want to really, you know, then the trumpet blast stops is how I understand it. And once all that's over, then the trumpet will stop and then the thousand year reigns begins. And, uh, you know, and that even that thousand year reign was put aside. It's a thousand years of rest for the world. You know, we were meant to, you know, work for 6,000 years and rest for 1,000 years. Uh, just work for six, rest for one. Work for six, rest for one. How it's always, always meant to be. Uh, it's really kind of a beautiful way for the king to return. And again, I want to say that this is hope. This shouldn't bring fear to you. This is saying, you know, unless you receive the mark of the beast, then you definitely should be terrified. Uh, but if you're of that remnant, that judgment that you go through, that fire judgment, he sees right through you and all those things of the world that I've done of the world, and there's a lot of them, uh, that just burns up like sticks and stubble. And those few things that we've done for the kingdom of heaven, uh, it's refined like pure gold. I mean, that's our glorified self. It's, it's really kind of a beautiful thing. I'm just going to go real quick back to 1 Corinthians 15.50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So truly understanding really that last trumpet, there's a lot going on. There's the rapture of the church. There's the war. There is the judgment. Uh, all of that is taking place in that last trumpet. Uh, but Jesus himself put it this way in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And that's me and you and those who are slain during the tribulation. So I hope this video helps. Again, it's just, I, there's a lot, you know, every time I talk about his return, people, you know, people say, well, also we're raptured at that time. Well, yeah, I know, it's, it, but it's confusing. There's three things taking place at his return. War, rapture, judgment. Uh, war, rapture, judgment. Those three things at that seventh trumpet. So I uh, hope this video helps. Any thoughts or insight on that, put it in the comments below. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. Feel called to support this channel with Patreon. That link is also below. But the most important part of this channel is we take prayer requests. So please don't ever hesitate to send that in. Thank you for watching this episode of God, Family, and Guns. And as always, love God. Love your family. Love guns.